Happy Groundhog's Day. Today is Groundhog's Day. Does it repeat like it's going over and over and over again? I have good news. Uh, Puxatawney Phil did not see his shadow, and so if he would have seen his shadow, it would have been six long weeks of winter, and now spring is closer. Isn't that good news? <laughs> spring is closer. Along with that good news, I have some bad news. He's been wrong 40% of, uh, he's been wrong, he's been right 40% of the time. So his, his uh, prediction is not always the greatest thing. They say this thing has been going on, Puxatawney Phil, he's been doing, not him, you know, his ancestors, have been doing it for 130 years. And I was looking online, they have others. They have some guy named Chuck up north. They have somewhere, something, you know, somebody has to see their shadow or whatever it is. But uh, I'm just, I'll just take all the good news I can about this time. It's kind of smack dab in the middle of a winter time. And the first of February is a good time because, you know, it's, it's not that far till spring, even if we do get some of the, you know, S stuff falling down like we had yesterday it's not going to be that long until we get that nice warm spring and it just it just feels good because it's not been a it's not been a bad winter as far as the weather as far as the snow and as far as the ice it's been fairly mild but it still can be long you have those short days and you have those long nights and it can be just weary and dreary as you go along and it, it, I don't know if it does anybody else, but it affects you. They talk about people that live way, way up north, like in Alaska, that that darkness affects them even mentally. They just get into this depressed condition. And then uh, when, when the sun comes out and the, and the flowers start blooming, the grass gets green, you know, you, you just feel better. That's why some people go down south so they can get a little bit of that freshness so they don't have to go through our winters. But I don't know about you, but sometimes I... I go through winters in other areas of my life. Every relationship has winters. Sometimes I just feel blah, and it, for some reason it just goes on and on. I don't think anybody else does, but do, do you ever get in this zone where you feel like you're just going through the motions? You just get up, get ready, go to work, come home, eat dinner, watch a few TV programs, go to bed, sleep, semi-good, get up in the morning and do it all over again. And life just seems to be dreary. Life just seems to be monotonous. There really doesn't seem to be anything. It, it just kind of, it just, it's kind of there. It happens even in our, in our spiritual life. We go to church, here's a good service. We go home, spend the rest of the day, might go back another time. We might pray a little bit. We might read our Bible a little bit. But, but as far as being, uh, let's be honest, excited about my Christian life and I'm really close to Jesus and Jesus is my best friend let's just be honest sometimes we feel like we're kind of blah we pray and we pray but nothing really happens I don't get this warm feeling I, I read my Bible I'm trying to read my Bible through and it's I don't want to be I don't, I don't want to admit it in church but it can get boring and where's God I pray and ask for stuff and nothing happens and it feels, like, it feels like I'm in the winter of my life. And maybe it could be something along like a, a death of someone or a tragedy or I've been disappointed in God and I expected God to do this and he didn't do it or I thought, I thought if I started going to church that things would start opening up and they just haven't and, and, and I, I just don't know. My, my, my Christian, I feel like I'm in God's time out, you know? Like does God hate me? Does God not like me? We're going to talk about that because Zacharias actually was in God's time out. You know, sometimes when you're going through some, some rough times in your life, um, you anticipate something big, you know. You want, you want spring to come in your life, but it's, it's just not happening, or at least it's not happening fast enough. And Zacharias had, had gone through this. So if you want to look in your Bible to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1. There was a priest. He was doing the right thing. And the Bible actually said that he and his wife were godly. There's nothing wrong. And God sent an angel, Gabriel, to tell him that he and his elderly wife, he was elderly too, were going to have a baby. They'd been praying for this. And then Zacharias, you know, it was a surprise. And Zacharias says, well, how can this happen? We're old. 
And, and God just says, okay, if, since, since you're doubting if it can be done, you're not gonna talk for nine months. You're gonna remain silent. Your wife will be pregnant, she'll be excited. You'll be excited, but you just won't be able to express it. So for nine full months, Zacharias couldn't say a thing. Sometimes we go through these times in our life because we've lacked faith, because we've lacked trust, because something has happened between us and God, and let's be honest, it wasn't God, it was us. But sometimes we go through this time because God wants to do a reset in our life. You know, the best of relationships can get monotonous, can't they? Many of us right now in this room, we're in a good relationship. There's nothing bad going on. But let's just be honest, there's not really anything really good going on. It's just been the same thing over and over and over and over again. But I guarantee you this, one of you take a trip for about four or five days on a business trip, or you gotta be gone, or you gotta be in the hospital, and that will rekindle things. A week ago was the helicopter crash of Kobe Bryant. That has really had ripple effects in our country. And I think what it has done, it has allowed people to see how fragile life is and how one moment a loved one, a legend, a great sports hero can be here and the next minute they're gone. And it has caused a lot of people to appreciate the relationships that they had and not take those relationships for granted. And so I think maybe that would be a good thing for us to do. I'll tell you what, the, the grief share presentation, the songs that we have sung, the song that Beth sang, they all have had this theme of, you know what, we're not alone. We go through hard times, we go through difficult times, but we can come back to God and get this thing renewed and God will take care of us. God will go with us through this winter season of our life, whatever it is. So, so what we're gonna read, and, and actually um, we're gonna see it read, um, is Zacharias when his son is finally born. And I want you to pay attention a little bit here uh, to the events that happen, but I want you also to see the fact that um, he's gonna praise God for what God has done. And so even though there's a time of difficulty, there's gonna be a time of praise, and we'll talk about that. So uh, let's just watch this. It's in Zechari or Zechariah, Luke chapter one. It begins in verse 57 through the end of the chapter. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias, after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake, and praised God. And fear came on all that went round about them. And all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. 
as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we shall be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. And it Zacharias couldn't speak for nine months. And it came time after John the Baptist was born, it came time to circumcise the child according to Jewish custom on the eighth day of their life. And uh, everybody figured his name would be Zacharias, named after his daddy. And in other words, at their age, they were probably only going to have one child, and one, that one was a son, and so just continue the fatherly line. And his wife said, no, we're going to call him John. They said, well, nobody in the family's named John. Where, where, where did you get that name? Let's, let's just call him Zacharias. And so they decided to go to Zacharias and, and, and get his viewpoint. Surely he would want a child named after him. And he got a writing tablet. And, and I imagine he did it forcefully. His name is John. And the reason why they named him John was because God said through Gabriel that you're going to name him John. And so as soon as that happened, it says... He could speak. And the first words out of his mouth were a praise to God. First words. And people began to wonder, what kind of person is this? And, and he became the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He, see, in the Old Testament, it prophesied that there would come a deliverer. Not just a deliverer for the Jews, but actually it promised a deliverer for all mankind. But there would come somebody that would be his front runner, somebody that would, would help people understand who he was, that would go before him. And that would be an important person as well. And that became John the Baptist. John the Baptist took that role over him. And he just praised God. It, it, it was as if, could you imagine um, being not able to talk, not able to express yourself for nine months? And actually, I love what, Zacharias in his little praise time he talks about in verse 68 he, he kind of gives some illustrations on what it's like it's like opening prison doors he says he will visit and redeem us that's what Jesus does Jesus visits and he redeems us he pulls us out there's a movie out right now called uh, Just Mercy it's about a man that was wrongly imprisoned and a lawyer came, took his case, and he was released. And there are many people that are in prison for, for wrong reasons and it's just amazing. Could you, could you imagine, and, and some of you can rightfully imagine, being in jail or being in prison, not able to get out, not able to see family, things happen outside and all you do is hear about it, and then that day that you're released. That's what it is like for Jesus, not only to come into the world, but for Jesus to come into your life. He says in verse uh, 71, it's like winning a battle. Now we don't, most of us don't get into battle. Some of you have been into military. Some of you actually have been in war at this time. Most of us, the only battle we ever get into is a sports battle. Today's the Super Bowl. Tonight's the Super Bowl, and we could have a real fight here to figure out who's going to win. You know, 49ers are the Chiefs. Okay, let's do this. 49ers, going to win tonight? Raise your hand. Okay, how many Chiefs? Okay, how many the Lions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that's anticipating something really, really big down the road. 
But yeah, now, could you imagine? Could you imagine winning the Super Bowl? Could you imagine winning the big championship? And some of you have. Some of you have been into ev- sporting events, and you know the struggle and the one, and then finally you win that championship. That's what he said. That's what it's like. The the the, vi- the thrill of victory that we get. He says in verse uh, seventy-seven. He says it's it's like canceling a debt, the remission of sins. The remission of our sins. It's like canceling a debt. What would it be like if somebody just paid off all your credit card bills? Now, wouldn't that be paid off your mortgage? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that just be a, all of your debt? You know, we talk about being debt free. What would happen? That's what Jesus did. And he praises this. He praises John the Baptist, who is the forerunner of the deliverer, the Messiah, Jesus. And he says, he is going to pay our, our sin debt. You see, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. death. There's a wage. When you do wrong, you're going to have to pay for what you've done wrong. And Jesus has paid for that by dying on the cross. He actually then goes on in verse 78, and he talks about I love this. Look at verse 78. He says, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. The day spring, that's weird. Day spring. Spring is, you know, a, a, a new life. And this is that first ray of, speaks of the first ray of light that comes up. You know, you have a long, dark night. If you've ever had a night where you just couldn't go to sleep and you just rolled and rolled and rolled and you got up and drank a glass of water and went to bed and got up and ate and you just couldn't, it just, or you were sick and you just couldn't get through the night and finally as the sun began to come up, he says, that's what it's like, a brand new day. Wouldn't it be nice to just to, just to have a brand new day where everything was fine? That's what it's like for Jesus to come into your life. It's like a brand new day. Zacharias had nine months of being in a cold, dark time in his life. He couldn't speak, and finally, God brought him out of it. God gave him that son, then God gave him a voice so that he could praise God, and he praised God for all that Jesus is going to do, all that John the Baptist is going to do. He found time to praise God, And, and here's what I want you to know. Whatever difficulty, struggle you're going through, When you have Jesus, he will walk through it with you. It does not necessarily mean that you're going to get out of it right away. My favorite passage is in Psalm 23. And in one of those verses, it says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. As dark as it is, as dreary as it is, as long sometimes as it seems it is, Jesus will walk right through that journey with you. There's some principles, and this is what I want you to pick up. Just this, actually, this whole section here, this section with Zechariah, there's some, some thoughts I want you to think of. Number one, God often works in unexpected ways. One of our problems in our life is we want God to do his will our way. And the Bible says that God's ways are not our ways. His ways are so much higher than ours. Much like my ways are higher than my grandkids. They don't understand things. They just want candy and play all the time. And sometimes they don't understand things. Sometimes I don't. God sometimes works in mysterious ways what he decides to do. And with with Zacharias, he had no concept that he was going to have a child. God God decided that he was going to give him a baby at his his elderly age, and he He didn't understand that, but sometimes God works in unexpected ways. The second thing is God does always fulfill his promise, always fulfills his promises. He promised him he would have a son, and he got a son. In the Old Testament, God promised that a deliverer, a Messiah is what they called it back then, promised Jesus would come, his son, and he did. God makes a promise, and he'll always take care of it. One of my favorite promises that I take so many times when I'm going through those dark times or when there's situations that I don't understand, we know that, it's Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. It does not say that all things are good, but all things work together for good. When you bake cookies, 
you put some things that are really nice and sweet, chocolate chips, sugar. And then you have to put some other things in, flour, raw eggs. Those things don't taste good right there. But if you mix them together, cook them up, it works together for good. And God will take not only the good things in our life, but also the rough things, the hard things, even the sinful, disobedient things. And if we allow him, he will work it all together and he will work it all for good. God does that. He always fulfills his promises. Third, God works his perfect will in his perfect timing. God's clock is not my clock. And sometimes it, it seems like God is going to be late, but he's always on time. God works his perfect will in perfect timing. And sometimes I don't understand it even right now. I look back on some of the things that have happened in my life and I go, God, I still, don't, I still can't figure it out. Why did you let that happen? You could have stopped it. Why didn't you let this happen? You could have made it happen. Why did you allow me to go down this path? Why didn't you stop me? Or why didn't you push me this way? And sometimes I don't understand why circumstances have happened in my life, but I am, I am guaranteed in my own life that when I get to heaven, I'm gonna look back on the course of my life and I'll say, you know what? He did everything exactly like I would want him to have happen. His perfect will in perfect timing. Hang on. It may not happen in the timing you want it to happen, but it will work in his perfect timing and you'll, you'll appreciate that. And the last one is praise belongs to God alone. I think it's interesting that Zacharias, when, when he got his voice back, he just had to stop and say, thank you, God. Thank you for what you've done. I praise you for all you've done. He praised him for Jesus who hadn't been born yet. He praised him for his son, but most of all, he praised God. And that's what we find out when, when God finally comes through, when God's perfect timing and he opens it up and the day comes up and the sun comes up and it's a new day and the spring is here, it's a good time then to stop and say, thank you, God, for all you've done. You know, what God does in our life, he doesn't do it haphazardly. The journey that he has in our life, he doesn't just say, oh, this would be fun, let's put him on it. He has a divine purpose and an intention. And if you feel right now that you're just going through the motions, maybe part of it might be that you need Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior. If you've been trying to go through life all by yourself, you don't have to. Trust him as your own personal Lord and Savior. Jesus died on the cross. We, we honor that by the crosses around our building and Many people wear crosses. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and provide a place for us in heaven. And whosoever will trust in him will have eternal life. Turn from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ. To simply pray, say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Admit you're a sinner. I believe in you. I believe that you died and rose again for me and I commit my life to you. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. It isn't just for religious people. As a matter of fact, it isn't, it isn't for good people because good people don't need a savior. It's for sinners. I'm a sinner. I needed Jesus. I'd encourage you to trust Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior. Let's bow our heads. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would encourage you right now in just the quietness of this time to pray in your heart to surrender your life to Jesus. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm the only one that goes through it, but I don't think I am. Sometimes I just go through dry times in my Christian life. And it helps me appreciate more the close times I have with Jesus. Maybe God hasn't been as responsive to you. Maybe God hasn't felt as close to you as he has in the past. Just because you can't feel his presence doesn't mean he isn't there. He is. 
He's made that promise to you. Trust him. Trust him. This dry time, this solitude-feeling time may be to draw you even closer to him. And you will have joy and praise in your life when that happens. In a few minutes, Barb's going to play through a song. And I invite you, if you want to come down and pray, maybe something's going on in your life, maybe something you really need to pray about or talk to God about. Or I'll be down here in the front if you'd like to talk to me. I would love to be able to have an opportunity to pray with you and for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the joy you bring in our life. Lord, sometimes we go through hard times. Sometimes it's our fault. The sooner we admit it, the sooner we can get back on track. But sometimes, Father, it's just the natural course of life. We can't be up on a mountaintop all the time. So, Father, if we feel like we're down in those valleys right now, help us to continue to trust you, to wait on your timing. And when we're out of this season in our life, we'll praise you. Help us to seek the help that we can if we can. But Father, I pray that you be near to us. I pray that you be with those who have not yet trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Maybe they're even doing that today. I pray, Lord, that they would know that if they'll simply call on you, you'll save their soul. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.